It is an honor and a privilege for me to present this keynote address at the Nickel Cobalt Copper Sessions of Alta 2020. My thanks to Alan for the opportunity. The topic of my presentation is bioleaching of nickel and cobalt, the progress and the potential. Bioleaching is most commonly associated with gold and copper, either for the treatment of refractory gold concentrates or for the heap leaching of copper sulfide ores. However, some of the more interesting applications have been for the recovery of nickel and cobalt across a wide variety of geographical and climatic conditions. From cobaltiferous pyrite tailings just north of the equator in Africa, to the extraction of nickel from a polymetallic ore just outside the Arctic Circle. To assess progress, we will examine case studies of five landmark projects, emphasizing projects that either reached an advanced stage of development or achieved commercial application. To assess the future potential, we will look at the markets for these two battery metals. We'll look at the impact of the growth in electric vehicle manufacture and in requirements for energy storage. And we'll look at various supply and demand factors. These are the five landmark projects that we will evaluate. The Bionic process was the first attempt to develop an integrated bioleaching process for nickel sulfide that could compete with smelting. It was developed by Billiton as an extension of the Biox process for refractory gold concentrates. The integrated process was a collaborative development between Billiton Process Research and Mintec. Billiton developed the bioleach process, whilst Mintec was responsible for the downstream solution purification and metals recovery circuit. The process development proceeded through various stages, from batch bench scale bioleach test work through to continuous mini plant testing in 120 litre reactors, culminating in a continuous demonstration scale plant. Nickel extractions well in excess of 90% were achieved. High feed solids concentrations of 17.5% were found to be possible. And the residence time required was between 7 and 10 days. The Bionic demonstration plant flow sheet is shown here. Iron precipitation from a PLS containing 40 grams per litre of iron was found to be very effective. The circuit included iron exchange and electro winning for nickel recovery and solvent extraction for cobalt recovery. This plant operated for six months and produced 700 kilograms of class 1 nickel. However, resin costs were found to be high and electro winning current efficiencies were low. An integrated bionic circuit was operated at Queensland Nickel's Yabulu Nickel Refinery in Australia. In this circuit, solvent extraction replaced iron exchange for nickel recovery. Nickel and cobalt recoveries of 94 and 98% respectively were achieved at a seven day residence time. Precipitation of iron was effective, removing 99% of the iron. Further polishing reduced the iron concentration to less than two milligrams per liter. Nickel solvent extraction produced a raffinate containing less than 100 milligrams per liter of nickel. Overall metal recoveries were between 92 and 95% for nickel and between 86 and 88% for cobalt. It was observed that unleached sulfides were liberated but unreacted and so a modest concentrate regrind was proposed as a means of improving metal dissolutions. Further developments of the bionic process included an investigation of the use of thermophilic microorganisms at 68 and 78 degrees Celsius. A nickel extraction of 98% was achieved in a residence time of four days at 68 degrees and three days at 78 degrees. However, with these high temperature microbes, the feed solids concentration was restricted to 10%. The technical development of the bionic process was clearly very successful. It was claimed at the time to be economically competitive and to be a viable process for the treatment of nickel sulfide concentrates. However, 
It did not achieve commercial implementation. Nevertheless, the development work laid the groundwork for the future application of bileaching for the treatment of nickel sulfide concentrates. Our next case study is the Kasesi Cobalt project in Uganda. The Kalembi copper mine produced 16 million tons of copper between 1956 and 1982. In the process, a 900,000-ton tailing stockpile containing 80% pyrite and 1.4% cobalt was created. Over time, this stockpile became dispersed over a wide area by heavy rainfall, releasing acid and heavy metals into the environment. This threatened a nearby national park, a lake, and the local communities. A solution that eliminated the ongoing environmental damage and recovered the cobalt was sought. The French company BRGM undertook a 10-year-long program of metallurgical process development for this project. Several factors favoured the feasibility of the project, including an abundant water supply, the proximity of a limestone quarry, reasonable infrastructure, political support and favourable site topology. An extensive development program included the evaluation of various bioleach parameters, um, gas-liquid mass transfer studies in tanks up to 65 cubic metres in volume, and the evaluation of various downstream flow sheets. A Cassesi process flow sheet included hydraulic reclamation of the pyrite concentrate, physical preparation of the concentrate and limestone, bioleaching, iron removal, solution purification and solvent extraction, cobalt electrowinning, and effluent treatment and waste management. Construction of the commercial plant began in 1998 and was completed in 1999. Bateman Minerals and Industrial of South Africa was the EPCM contractor and there were multiple process and technology consultants used in the execution of the project, including Signet from Australia, Krebs from France, BRGM from France, which supplied the bioleach technology, Mintec, which supplied the cobalt electrowinning technology, and Herban Industries from France, which supplied the bioleach agitation system. The bioleach section of the plant comprised of five 1,380 cubic meter bioleach reactors arranged as three primary reactors in parallel with two secondary reactors in series. At the time, these were the largest mechanically agitated bioleach reactors yet constructed. The operating temperature was 42 degrees C. The overall heat load, which was 25 megawatts, arose mainly from the exothermic pyrite oxidation reaction. An interesting feature of these reactors were the brosium bioleach agitators. These are vastly different from the high solidity ratio axial flow impellers that are the norm in these kinds of systems. The technology was supplied by the French company Reban Industries, now known as Milton Roy Mixing. The system consisted of two upper axial flow impellers and a lower 18 blade disc turbine, aerated through four open pipes beneath the turbine. The system was capable of dispersing up to 20,000 normal cubic meters per hour of air in the three primary reactors to satisfy the volumetric oxygen demand of 33 kilograms per cubic meter per day. By 2002, this plant was producing 67 tons per month of cobalt, which was 2% of world production at the time. According to BRGM, this was the first industrial installation incorporating bioleaching into a sophisticated hydrometallurgical flow sheet, allowing the selective extraction of various metals. And as such, in the history of biometallurgy, this operation can be considered as the milestone opening an era of the complex application of bioleaching. It was certainly a major step forward in the development of base metal bioleaching, aside from copper. By 2014, the pyrite stockpiles had been treated, the site environment had been restored, and the plant was closed. Next, we're going to look at the development of bioheap technology. This was developed by Titan Resources through its subsidiary Pacific Ore Technology. It made use of a proprietary moderately thermophilic bacterial culture and it was tested and demonstrated at the site of the Radio Hill Mine in Western Australia using the Mount Shoal copper nickel ore. 
That ore contains 0.92% copper, 0.67% nickel, and 11.1% iron. The major minerals are chalcopyrite, pentlandite, and pyrotite. The bioheap process development progressed through batch tests on mold samples to a 5 meter aerated column bioleach test. In this test, though, the redox potential remained low and most of the iron was in the ferrous form. So a separate 1 meter column test, which was packed with inert material, was undertaken. This was used to simulate an external iron oxidizing heap. The project then proceeded to a demonstration scale test in which two 5,000 ton test heaps, each 5 meters high and fitted with aeration pipes, were constructed. The first heap was stacked with minus 7.5 millimeter Mount Shoal ore, and the second or auxiliary heap was stacked with minus 50 millimeter barren rock. Both heaps were aerated at 1,000 cubic meters per hour. The plant also included a PLS pond and a small treatment plant. The two heaps were inoculated with their respective microorganisms. Then liquor from the PLS pond was circulated to the auxiliary heap for iron oxidation. Liquor from the waste heap was sent to iron precipitation. Nickel was precipitated as a mixed hydroxide and copper was extracted using a bank of EMU electrowinning cells. Nickel recovery of 90% and a copper recovery of 50% were achieved in 12 months of operation. Temperatures of 40 to 50 degrees Celsius were maintained during periods of normal operation. During periods of no irrigation, heap temperatures exceeded 80 degrees Celsius. These high temperatures were achieved through the exothermic oxidation of pyrotite and also the warm ambient conditions that prevailed. The BioHeap field trial was considered a great success, yielding results beyond expectation. The Mount Shoal ore had a low acid consumption, although the value was not reported. The BioHeap technology, however, did not proceed to commercial application, owing to a lack of suitable deposits with sufficiently low acid consumption. However, this project certainly laid the groundwork for future endeavours in a very different location on the other side of the planet. And that's where we head to next, to the Talvivara Terra Fame project in Sotkamo in Finland. This is a tale of two halves, encompassing science, technology and engineering, politics, law and yes, even the arts. The Talvivara deposits of Sotkamo are the largest nickel deposits in Europe. The current resource estimate is 1,550 million tonnes. It is a complex ore containing nickel, zinc, copper, cobalt, iron, sulphur and carbon. Main minerals are pyrotite, pyrite, pentlandite, sphalerite, violarite, chalcopyrite, and graphite. Sotkamo is situated at a latitude of 64 degrees north. Winter temperatures of 0 to minus 20 degrees Celsius prevail, and they occasionally reach below minus 30 degrees. An average annual snowfall of 0.7 meters is expected. Following considerable process development work, a demonstration heap trial was set up on the site. This comprised a 17,000 ton heap, 30 meters by 60 meters and 8 meters high, constructed in 2005. Ore was crushed to 80% passing 8 millimeters. Heap temperatures of 30 to 90 degrees Celsius were achieved, with PLS temperatures of 40 to 50 degrees C. The metal recoveries over 500 days of operation were nickel 92%, zinc 82%, cobalt 14% and copper 2.5%. In February 2007 the heap was reclaimed and restacked and the final recoveries after a further 21 months were nickel 99%, zinc 99%, cobalt 35% and copper 22%. The commercial plant was designed to treat between 24 and 25 million tonnes per annum of ore. Construction commenced in April 2007, mining began in April 2008, a bioheap leaching process was initiated in July 2008, and the first metal sulphides were produced in October of that year. From open pit mining, the ore proceeds through three stages of crushing to 80% less than 8 millimetres. The ore is agglomerated with PLS before being stacked on two primary heaps, each 2,400 meters long, 400 meters wide, 
and 8 meters high. Secondary leach pads are stacked with four 15 meter lifts. The primary leach cycle is 13 to 14 months long and the secondary leach cycle lasts about three and a half years. Metals recovery is by sulfide precipitation using H2S. It proceeds via precipitation of copper sulfide, then of zinc sulfide, pre-neutralization and zinc removal, precipitation of a mixed nickel cobalt sulfide, iron removal and final precipitation. The ambitious initial annual production targets for this project were 50,000 tons of nickel, 90,000 tons of zinc, 15,000 tons of copper and 1,800 tons of cobalt. However, production ramp up was slow and by 2011 the nickel production was just over 16,000 tons and the zinc production was just under 32,000 tons. Many problems were encountered, particularly in the crushing, heap reclamation and metals recovery sections of the plant. Major production interruptions were experienced in 2012 and 2013, as well as several leaks of metal contaminated tailings. By 2014, these serious challenges drove the Talvivara Mining Company to bankruptcy. Members of management were charged with criminal environmental offences. The story of Talvivara even became the subject of a fictionalized film, Gati Leinen in Finnish, The Mine in English, that was released in 2016. Following considerable government intervention, the asset was acquired by Terra Fame in 2015 and a new commissioning phase started. Many improvements have been made to the operation in the past five years. It was found that the material hardened significantly during primary leaching, losing its granularity and fusing together. This made remining of the ore very difficult and the original single bucket wheel excavation system was not up to the task. Mobile surface mining with a rotating spiked drum crushing the heap surface has proven an effective solution. Repositioning of the aeration and drainage pipes was also implemented and downtime has been reduced by optimizing the movement and stacking of the ore after remining the primary leach pad. Metal production has increased steadily over the past few years and in 2019 it reached over 27,000 tons of nickel and over 55,000 tons of zinc. The targets for the next few years are 30,000 tons of nickel and 60,000 tons of zinc. Future plans for the Terrafame project include uranium production and the establishment of a battery chemicals plant. A uranium extraction permit was granted in February 2020, but it will be several years before production will commence. Plans for the battery chemicals plant were announced in late 2017. The plant will produce 150,000 tons per annum of nickel sulfate and 5,000 tons per annum of cobalt sulfate for the electric vehicle industry, making it one of the largest nickel sulfate producers in the world. Production is expected to start in 2021. This project is certainly one of the most notable applications of biohydrometallurgy for the treatment of nickel and cobalt sulfides. Our last case study takes us just 200 kilometers south of the Terra Fame operation to Vuonos, also in Finland. Mondo Minerals, now Elementus PLC, is a talc producer with two mines located in Sotkamo and Vuonos. A byproduct of the talc production process is a pyrotide rich concentrate that contains nickel and a little bit of cobalt. It also contains a small amount of arsenic. The concentrates were previously sold to toll smelters, but penalties associated with the arsenic content made this less and less attractive. Mondo selected Mintex proprietary bioleaching technology for the treatment of this concentrate. Mintex undertook a two year long metallurgical test work program encompassing three phases of test work to develop the process. The flow sheet that was developed included regrinding of the concentrate to 80% passing 20 microns and concentrate upgrading by magnetic separation and flotation. Nickel and cobalt extractions in bioleaching of 97 to 98% were achieved in a seven day residence time and at a 15% feed solids concentration. Iron removal of over 99% was achieved and an MHP product containing 42% nickel and 2.4% cobalt was produced. 
The Mondo Minerals bileach plant is a small plant designed to treat just 35 tonnes per day of concentrate. Initially, the plant comprised of seven bileach reactors, but an eighth one was added later. The overall design residence time was seven days, and the process operated using moderately thermophilic microbes at an operating temperature of 46.5 degrees Celsius. After bileaching, iron is removed by limestone precipitation in five vessels operated in series. The product slurry is thickened, the overflow is clarified and sent to the metal precipitation circuit. In the metal precipitation circuit, a mixed hydroxide precipitate with a typical nickel content of 42% is produced. The precipitant is magnesia and the target pH level in the circuit is between 7 and 7.2. These pictures show the 110 cubic meter bileach reactors at the Mondo Minerals nickel sulfide plant and the high solidity ratio agitation system that is used in the primary bileach reactors. Inoculation and startup of the plant commenced in September 2015. MHP production was achieved in December of that year. In April and May of 2016, a sampling campaign over the bileach plant confirmed nickel and cobalt extractions of 97.4 and 98.4% respectively. The MHP quality has exceeded design specifications, typically containing 47% nickel and 2% cobalt. The MHP product was sold to a refinery for the production of battery grade nickel and cobalt sulfates. Towards the end of 2018, Mondo Minerals was acquired by Elementus PLC. In view of the declining nickel price at the time, the new owners decided to suspend the operation, which is now in care and maintenance mode. The production cessation is considered temporary, and so, as with Talvivara Terra fame, there may be another chapter that is yet to be written. And so, to examine the potential, a future that is linked to automobiles and energy storage. The suitability and versatility of bioleaching has clearly been demonstrated for the treatment of both nickel and cobalt ores and concentrates. However, commercial application remains rare. Opportunities may increase if the markets for these metals widen, however. Nickel and cobalt are both battery metals, and future demand is predicted to be closely linked to the emergence of the light electric vehicle industry. Terra Fame and Mondo Minerals have shown the way. More than a dozen papers have been published at Alta in the past two years, discussing battery metals and the emerging LEV industry. At some point, a deficit in supply is projected, and battery chemical flow sheets are being developed, tested, evaluated, and implemented. Two questions arise, though. What is the likely rate of uptake of LEVs in the medium term? And will battery technologies evolve to exclude nickel, cobalt, and even copper, driven by a need for improved storage capacity and cost reduction? This graph shows that there has been a pattern of continued growth in the electric vehicle market over the past 10 years. Over 2 million new vehicles were sold in 2019, equivalent to 2.5% of all new car sales. This trend is expected to be sustained through the 2020s. Looking ahead, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is significant, and annual car sales are expected to reach pre-COVID-19 levels only by 2024. Total annual electric vehicle car sales are projected to rise to 31.1 million by 2030, securing 32% of the new car sales market. Recently, we've heard that motor manufacturers are in discussions with miners to secure direct lines of supply. Up to 20% of the cost of an electric vehicle is the cost of the battery, and cobalt is usually the most costly component. Eliminating cobalt may reduce costs, but overheating and fire risks may increase, so additional safety adjustments will be needed. Cobalt demand may be boosted by the need for larger rechargeable batteries and more energy storage for 5G technology, both in mobile phones and base stations. Stationary storage demand is expected to grow by 35% per annum through the 2020s. For now, therefore, nickel and cobalt will feature in the switch to a low-carbon economy. Sulfide resources are diminishing, and laterites are expected to feature strongly in meeting demand, but laterite processing is complex. Recycling is also li likely to feature in the future, and it has even been suggested that the exploitation of undersea resources may be the only way to meet future demand. If demand does grow, 
and motor manufacturers and miners continue to cozy up to each other, exploration will inevitably increase and new sulphide deposits may emerge. And that's where the potential lies. And this review of notable past successes shows that, if needed, bioleaching technologies are ready and waiting. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, John, for your presentation. And thanks for getting up in the middle of the night to uh, be available for questions. So we haven't got a lot, lot of time. Uh, but uh, very quickly, the first one uh, was uh, from Fatima, who, who asks, was salinity an important factor in the bioleaching case study conducted in Queensland? Thanks. Um, in in what I'd, I've read about the um, that project in Queensland, salinity was not mentioned. So um, the short answer uh, to the question regarding the Queensland Nickel project is no, but um, perhaps I can address salinity more generally. Um, uh, there have been parts of the world where bioleach projects have been uh, executed where salinity has been a feature. Um, and I think what's emerged is that the bioleach bacteria um, are capable of tolerating um, quite high levels of chloride salinity. Um, uh, in, in tank leaching, I think uh, single figure chloride concentrations are, are, are quite acceptable. Um, and I know there have been projects, there was a, the You and Me um, refractory gold project in Western Australia. Um, there was definitely an element of, of chloride salinity in the water. In heap leaching, um, I think those numbers are even higher, um, uh, heading towards even 20 grams per liter of, of uh, chloride salinity. So whilst uh, chloride may be a, a problem when it comes to materials of construction, I think from a purely processing point of view, um, there have certainly been advances over the over the past few years. Okay, thanks, John. Just moving on um, from uh, Bryn Harris, who asks, uh, bioleaching is a very interesting process. In general, it generates a greater mass of material than it starts with. It never completely detoxifies thing, tailings. It mobilizes arsenic and is not able to recover either the intrinsic energy of the sulfides or the PGMs. How would you respond to this? I, I would say that uh, all of those are valid, uh, valid comments. Um, in terms of um, more mass, um, that is quite correct. Um, one um, in 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 the leaching process, um, very often, particularly with nickel and cobalt, um, there's a lot of iron present, um, and and so once that is uh, precipitated, it, it does create a voluminous mass, um, which needs to be uh, deposited on, 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 on tailings dams. It's certainly one of the, um, I suppose, one of the weaknesses of the process. In terms of um, uh, to tailings toxicity and, and arsenic mobilization, um, whilst that is true, I think one of the um, advantages of the process is that provided the iron arsenic ratio is sufficiently high, um, uh, arsenic is extremely stable in the tailings environment. And I, there have been numerous long-term studies conducted uh, at operations uh, to show that that is, that is the case. Um, Energy recovery is also, I suppose, an issue. Um, it's, I've always considered um, a bioleach reactor to be um, akin to an underwater furnace in a sense, but uh, the heat that is generated is low level heat. And so it is very difficult to recover energy from that. Um, in our, in the, um, project, the Mondo Minerals project in Finland, um, some of the uh, waste heat was recovered and used um, in, in the flotation process um, to improve the kinetics of flotation. So um, with, with the excess water that one, one experienced at that project, um, 
and the proximity of, of fresh water to the project, it was possible to to use uh, fresh water for, for cooling of the bioleach reactants. And that water that was then um, moved into the flotation circuit uh, in, uh, with the purpose of, of, of improving the flotation kinetics. Um, and finally, I think the, the, the last part of that question relates to PGMs. Um, that is true. None of the, the projects that we've spoken about um, have had um, PGMs as a, as a recoverable portion of the, of the material. But the recovery of PGMs from bioleach residues, I think that's, you put your finger on it, Bryn, um, that's certainly an area that, that could require some development. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, next one from uh, Jan Chris. Uh, is bioleaching more sensitive to nickel cobalt price fluctuations than other technologies? I think that any, um, any hydrometallurgical process that is trying to compete with smelting um, is, it, it needs to have uh, certain factors that, that, that make the economics compelling. Um, the, for example, um, uh, again, coming to arsenic, the presence of arsenic can, can make the penalties that apply um, for smelting more significant. And then the hydrometallurgical alternative, whether it's bioleaching or any other process, um, and irrespective of what the metal is, um, it becomes it becomes more attractive. So I wouldn't say that it is more so in in, in nickel and in, and cobalt. Um, it applies pretty equally across the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, next one's uh, is from uh, Marnie. Uh, thanks, John. Can you comment on the use of advanced uh, bioinformatics? and synthetic biology to enhance bioleaching. Alan, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could, would you mind just repeating that? Oh, you're going to ask, ask me to read that word again. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, <laughs> can you comment on the use of advanced bioinformatics and, in, and synthetic biology to enhance bioleaching? Um, it's certainly not anything uh, that my research group at Mintec has has um, has delved into. Bioleaching is an open system. It's a it's a it's a system that uh, relies on the survival of the fittest. And our view has always been that um, one allows the microbial population in a bioleaching system, whether it's a tank leaching system or a heap leaching system to evolve as the process conditions change. And there's been quite a lot of work done in, in, in certain laboratories to, to track that, to see how in, uh, changes in, in bioleach conditions impact on the, on the microbial populations. But in terms of bioinformatics, no, it's not something that, uh, that that my research group has has addressed. Okay, we'll try and squeeze one more in, and if you, uh, we're going to have to go off before too long. Uh, and but you can uh, continue to add uh, questions to the to the uh, chat afterwards, and John maybe will answer in due course. Maybe when he wakes up tomorrow, uh, <laughs> or you can email him, and uh, you can keep that going. And uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to uh, keep the conversation going. One quick one from uh, Murdoch McKenzie. You mentioned that the bionic process EW efficiencies were low. Cause Nickel ran a very successful uh, SXEW uh, circuit for about two years, uh, producing about 10,000 tons per annum nickel. The current efficiency was about 90%. They used bagged anodes. Strong electrolyte was 100. Can't believe it. So could a quick, we just got a quick answer before we have to go. Um, again, I was relying on published information uh, to uh, from quite a while back. Um, so I have no doubt that uh, Murdoch is correct and there have probably been significant advances in, uh, 
in electro winning technology and, and improvements in, in uh, current efficiencies. Yeah, so it probably not necessarily specific to to uh, bio leaching as opposed to designing a better even running a better EW plant than than you've got. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think I think we're just about out of time. So thanks for that, and uh, we'll pass on to the next uh, uh, presentation. Thanks a lot, John. Enjoy a good sleep. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alan.